Good morning. I'm just waiting for one more panelist to join us on the stage. While we're waiting for that, just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, in the event we need to exit, uh, exits are right here, clearly marked. Restrooms are right down the hall to the left. And uh, we will uh, be mindful to end on time so you can make your way to the keynote uh, following. Uh, anything else? <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, one more thing. Please, please uh, make sure you download the app for the conference so you know where to go. You can fill out surveys. Uh, it's right on the I, uh, iTunes App Store, and also there's a special link for the Android app uh, displayed uh, around the conference. So if you have any questions, just ask any of the good folks uh, with the Ask Me uh, or the staff here in the room. So with that, uh, welcome to our first panel of the day. Uh, this is the Open Government Data Panel. I am your host and your moderator, John Stevenson. Uh, I am part of the AWS Global Public Policy team here and someone who has both uh, benefited and worked towards open data. But uh, despite my very minor role, uh, I've uh, been uh, very uh, big fans of the panelists uh, we have here today because they've been driving a lot of the open data efforts, both from a policy and a business perspective, really uh, all over the world. So what we'd like to do today is to have them share some of their perspectives, uh, their thoughts, and where do they see open data going in the, in the aftermath of the Open Data Government Act here in the United States, and also efforts internationally in places like Canada. Uh, I'm here to be the moderator facilitator to get the conversation going. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for some questions from the audience. So I hope you'll have some good things you want to uh, uh, ask our panel. Uh, because we really have a great uh, uh, deep pool of talent and knowledge here about open data. Uh, our panelists are uh, Mona Siddiqui, uh, who is the Chief Data Officer for the U.S. Department of Health and Ser Human Services. We're also joined by Dan Castro, Vice President of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, Tom Lee, who is the Director of Policy of Mapbox, and last but certainly not least, Jamie Boyd, who is the Director of Open Government for the Treasury Board of Canada. So let's dive right in to uh, our panel questions. Uh, Mona, I'd like to start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and why open data is important to your agency's mission. Yeah, uh, so HHS is um a really large organization. We are a uh, collection of 29 different units. Uh, we're a $1.3 trillion um, organization with 90,000 employees. Um, and uh, open data has really been, uh, I think has led to a huge culture shift for us in the last 10 years. During the last administration, I would say we were really the leaders in the federal space in making data available for researchers and entrepreneurs. Um, and released about 2,000 data sets for public use. Um, where we really um, have been looking now is uh, not only at how are we making data publicly available um, for, for uh, our users on the outside, but also how are we helping facilitate that data um, being used by the 29 different units within HHS. Um, because oftentimes, the challenges uh, that exist for people to have access to our data on the outside are the same challenges that we face internally as a, as a large organization and, and getting access inside. And so that has been the, sort of the, the dual focus for the work that we're doing um, in, in kind of taking it to the next level, which I can talk about more. Excellent. Uh, Dan, uh, I'm certainly very familiar with ITIF and have read your incredible, thoughtful work, but for the benefit of our audience, tell us a little bit about ITIF, what you do on open data, and why it's important to your work. Yeah, so thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm with an organization called the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. I run our Center for Data Innovation. So we're a think tank. We're focused on the intersection of technology, data, and public policy. Our mission is really to help policymakers understand how data is a, a new kind of lever in government that they can use to help achieve better outcomes, whether it's in healthcare or education or, or any other public goal that they have. And so part of the way that you can use data is, is through open data, um, through making more data available and accessible, through improving data quality, through thinking about how data um, is collected and, and can be shared with different partners under different mechanisms. 
And um, if you kind of go back, it was you know when Obama first came into the office as president that on his you know right right at the very beginning there was an open government. Uh, directive that said, you know, openness is going to be a key part of how government goes forward, and data is going to be a part of that. And you know, they they moved forward and they started doing a number of uh, open data projects. And one of our recommendations at the time was that you know this needs to be something that transcends more than one presidency. This should be something that is just part of what the federal government does. And we were starting to see states and local governments doing this. Um, and so we worked with some members of Congress to put together the Open Government Data Act, which you know codified this rule. And you know, it was just this past January where the law went into effect, and now you know, we have the, the big challenge ahead of us of how do we take this, this really important law and implement it and make sure that it, it achieves the benefits we want to see in terms of much more openness and data in the future. Thank you. So Tom, uh, Mapbox, I've uh, certainly been uh, made familiar with your company through my work in learning how to code. Uh, but for the benefit of our audience, tell us a little about uh, Mapbox and how you use open data and why it's important to your company. Sure. Well, we're a map and location services company, as you might have guessed. The mapping part is probably obvious. We provide really beautiful, customizable maps to clients like Snapchat, TikTok, visualization folks like Tableau, um, or you know, weather apps like the Weather Channel. Uh, the location services are things like finding directions to a, a point on that map or searching for an address or, or a point of interest. And open data, particularly from government sources, is a key part of how we do business. We stitch together dozens and dozens of data sources to power those maps and services. Some of them are community projects like OpenStreetMap or Wikidata. Some are proprietary. Some we make ourselves out of data we collect. But uh, government has a fundamental role to play in the creation of spatial data. Uh, for one thing, it's really expensive and complicated to fly satellites, and those turn out to be important. Um, government tends to be involved there. And for another, there are types of data that are crucial to our business that government is the source of truth for. So the uh, address number on a house, they get to make that up. Uh, the uh, boundaries where a, a district or county begins and ends, like that is canonically defined by government. So they're always part of this flow and ensuring that that data is accessible and useful as basic infrastructure for everyone in the industry and and everyone out there who needs to use maps in the course of their daily lives. That's, that's a crucial part of any open data policy. Uh, Jamie, uh, we've talked and we started this panel uh, talking about the uh, United States Open Government uh, Data Act. Uh, but that's certainly not the only uh, government in the world uh, that's really been leading the way and uh, really been uh, driving forward uh, open government, open data. So talk to us a little bit about what's happening at Treasury Board of Canada and just Canada's uh, open government uh, efforts. Absolutely. So first of all, it is so exciting to see a room full of people who want to talk about open data. So thank you for coming out to join us for that. Uh, it's often smaller rooms. People are a little bit less excited. So it's particularly reassuring to me to know that, the, that there's at least enthusiasm for, for a future based on open data. Um, so I work at the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat. It's a central agency that essentially coordinates the federal family in Canada when it comes to IT, IM, and in my case, open data. We run a, a website, open.canada.ca. Um, we host about 80,000 data sets from 66 federal departments and agencies. We also have all the proactive disclosure content around contracting, hospitality, position reclassification for 115 federal departments and agencies. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do with this portal, with open.canada.ca, is maximize the release of high-quality content that's going to allow Canadians, Canadian businesses, um, innovators around the world to make use of what we consider to be really rich and high-quality content. We've gone through quite an evolution in the past couple of years. Um, we started off in the sort of late 2000s uh, just saying, let's, let's spit out all the data that we can. So in Canada, we have a huge country, obviously. We've invested quite heavily in our satellite systems. We have great geospatial data. And I was like, fantastic. We'll take that and we'll open it up, allow people to do what they will with, with this open data. So we started off with way more data than we have now. And we've gone through a bit of an evolution. We created our 2014 Directive on Open Government that was still talking about accelerating and maximizing the release of open data. And over time, we realized that it was more important to focus on quality, predictability, and really availability of the things that people wanted. So over time, we've consolidated a lot of our data sets. We've built a lot of capacity within the federal family so that folks can better understand what innovators like our friends at Mapbox or anywhere else in the ecosystem, what is it that they're going to use to um, really advance service delivery to, to citizens. The kinds of objectives that we're embracing when we push on open data are things like transparency. 
You should know what your government is up to, your taxpayer, you should, you should have that awareness. Accountability, so you should know what kind of decisions I'm making as a federal official when it comes to government procurement. You should be able to easily understand that sort of thing. And that's exactly why we lowered the threshold for proactive disclosure of grants and contributions to $1. So you can see all federal grants and contributions in Canada now. And citizen participation. So it isn't just about, hey, look, I've, I've opened up 80,000 data sets. It's all right, what are we going to do on the basis of that? So we develop national action plans every two years with, uh, with Canadians, with citizens. And for the most recent one that we did, we had 10,000 Canadians that helped us develop that plan. So we're really trying to build out that sort of that resilience and the feedback loops on the basis of the content that we're making available. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jamie. And I, I echo uh, your comments that it's wonderful to see such a uh, large crowd here to talk about open data. Perhaps they thought we were going to talk about basketball uh, <laughs> at, this, at this panel. So, oh, there's uh, nothing to talk about. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, moving on. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit about you know, the government's role in promoting open data, open data policies at uh, the government of Canada, the United States government. But I, I'm curious for the panel, and this is an open question for anybody, uh, what's our private sector role? You know, here at uh, AWS, you know, we uh, make a lot of data available free and open to the public using our storage and, and other products. Uh, Tom, uh, Mapbox is an open source tool. But I'm curious for the panel, like, what role can the private sector play in, in encouraging the use of open data, making it more valuable to s government agencies, to other citizens? Uh, what, what do you see as uh, uh, some of the ways they can do that? Anybody on the panel? I guess it's it's maybe most straightforward to use an example like maps. So I'll start since this should be relatively easy. But like if you go to the, the US Census website, or maybe better their FTP site, since these are some creaky systems, uh, you will find a ton of geospatial data. And uh, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who could make use of it, but it is probably not in the final form you would want to get it in, right? You would have to download it over the course of days and transform it into something that would actually serve your purposes. Um, and probably combine it with other data sets as well. So there's, there's obviously a role for people to integrate this data and create compelling user experiences um, that uh, you know, serves particular market needs. It's not, before Mapbox, I was at a nonprofit called the Sunlight Foundation, and this was often a division that we talked about. Should government be a data retailer or a wholesaler? And we came down on the latter half, right? Um, the thought was that government is not really set up to figure out all the different use cases in the market that exist or could exist. Um, what they need to do is provide the infrastructure that can then be developed by businesses that try new things, that fail, that succeed, uh, and try to build a, a sort of sustainable set of underlying systems, just like the roads outside or the pipes are under our feet that power this important part of the economy. Uh, and I guess the other part that's incumbent on the private sector beyond kind of doing their jobs and trying to build these businesses is to be part of this conversation about where do we draw the line on socializing these costs, right? At, at some point, the end users should be paying for the creation and maintenance of this data, um, but it's hard to figure out exactly where that lies because there's also a, a gigantic amount of stuff where it makes sense to share these costs. It's, it's a utility that everybody needs. Uh, so uh, figuring out that balance is, is a key part and you know, being part of the conversation is incumbent on us too. Thank you, Tom. Others, uh, thoughts on that, what role the private sector can play? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say, you know, I think one of the challenges the government has sometimes is um, basically figuring out how it can manage all the data it has and, and get it out there in a way that's useful. Um, one of the, um, I think, most interesting projects that I've seen over the last couple of years came about through a partnership that um, the Department of Commerce, uh, specifically NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, did, where they had, um, it was something like on the order of 19, um, terabytes of data a day they were being produced from some of their geospatial um, uh, satellites and, and monitoring. And they said this was more data than they could, um, with their existing infrastructure, make available publicly. Um, and so what they did is they said, we'll see if we can partner with the private sector to do something interesting here. And so um, they had a, what was a no-cost contract, so it didn't cost the government anything where they said, you know, open to any partners in the, in the private sector that want to partner with us. If you make a certain amount of data that we have here publicly available um, with these, you know, conditions, so no cost to the public, um, then, then you can do, you can add any other value-added services you want on top of that. 
And we saw a number of partners step up and do that. I believe Amazon was one of those partners. Um, and to me, that's the kind of partnerships that, that deliver tremendous value because you had data that was previously inaccessible, now available to the public. You had the government able to do more without expending any taxpayer dollars. And then you had the private sector being able to also monetize this data in, in ways that they wouldn't have been able to do either. And so it was kind of a win on all sides. And so I think as we, as we start moving forward in this area, there's questions about how can we have more of these really innovative partnerships where we think about um, you know, what's next beyond just government putting data on, on data portals. And we think about this kind of long tail of uh, you know, the super large data sets, the data sets that uh, maybe are sensitive and need to be released in certain more private contexts, and figure out how we get more data out there because that's how we get more value. Can I add something? Um, and I, I guess I'll speak from my particular perspective of being at a healthcare agency. Uh, obviously, the healthcare sector is highly regulated. The data that we have is also incredibly highly regulated. Uh, and I think that we need to have and engage in a long term proactive conversation around um, the norms and the rules around privacy um, and the granularity of the data that we're all comfortable with releasing. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think anybody now really questions, which I think they probably did 10 years ago, um, questions the value of open data. But how do you get there in a way that that data is actually usable and that we're not just doing a, a check the box and, you know, we make data available, but it's not in a way that can really be connected to other data sets or, um, uh, or, or linked for purposes of really creating value. Um, and I don't really see that conversation happening right now uh, in, in a robust way across the public and private sector. And I, I, I think it's no longer sufficient to do a lot of hand waving around uh, open data. I think we have to have a really deep conversation around um, uh, the, the limits of, of, of what we're comfortable with sharing, uh, whether it's behavioral mental health data and, and how do we feel about that as, as citizens and as, as, as a government. Um, or you know, it's it's um, other information that can be really highly sensitive. Um, and so, what is that calculus between between value um, and individual privacy? Absolutely. I'm just curious. Uh, just by a show of hands, who here is in the public sector and private sector? All right. So it's a little bit biased towards the public sector. Um, it's helpful context. I, 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 I've been working in this space for a number of years, and I think that the, the role of the private sector in maximizing the value and impact of governments opening up data is unprecedented. You know, I, I spent a lot of time talking my face off about digital change, and like, no, digital change is not gradually happening to us, it has happened. Like, we live in a world where, sure, I'm opening up really high quality road network data, Pretty sure Uber's got better road network data than I do, right? Same goes for labor market data. Employment and Social Development Canada has fantastic data. Pretty sure that if we were ma to mash it up with LinkedIn data, we would be better off collectively, right? So you can think of really interesting case studies where the private sector can not only innovate often better than the, pri than the public sector with the, with the value of the data, but it can also add to it in really exciting ways. Now, of course, there are all sorts of interesting dynamics in terms of how do you monetize that, how do you allow it to sort of build out your, your business model, but you can really easily think about using data that is in private sector possession to build ecosystems that are gonna be more powerful and sort of more robust than they would be on your own. So I'll give you a very quick example. Uh, a major car manufacturer came to us and they said, hey, we've got this cool new fleet of cars. They've got these little sensors, and as they're driving along the road, if they bump, they'll send, you know, it, we, they'll, they'll basically indicate that there's a pothole forming. So that's an example of opening up that data. You feed it into the municipality, and they can say, ah, I've got, a, I've got a road issue, right? And now I'm filling up a pothole before it's turned into a major you know, sinkhole. We, we have cold winters and the roads are terrible in, in, in Canada. Um, so being able to identify road network issues early on on the basis of private sector generated open data is going to be way better. Um, it's good for fleet maintenance, it's good for the driver's experience, but it's also good from a public sector efficiency perspective. And that's data that we simply do not have the capacity to collect or disseminate within the public sector. But we've got awesome data with regards to the materials that are used for the road network, and you know, all that sort of thing. So it's sort of a, a silly little anecdote, but I think it's a telling one in that if you use private sector generated data, you mash it up with public sector, you can get some really exciting uh, scope for collaboration. 
Obviously, we have to be uh, careful from a privacy and security perspective, but it seems like those are conversations that are well worth having on a collective basis. So, uh, Bona, I'd like to turn back to you with a two-part question. Um, you talked about, you know, op op we're past kind of the technical conversations. You know, we, we, there's a widespread consensus that open data is good, it's here to stay. Um, and HHS, I think, has really been at the forefront before others, even in the U.S. government, driving the open data conversation forward. So um, how, how do you think the Open Data Government Act uh, is helping to achieve the mission of, of you know, extracting value? And, and what are you, you, you mentioned some of the things you're hoping to achieve uh, on whether on mental health, behavioral health, um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Well, what are some of the outcomes you're, you're working towards with, with open data? Well, first, I guess I just want to make sure we're all uh, on the same page around what the act is. So how many people are familiar with what it says? And if not, I can, okay, so maybe I'll just give a couple, and you can help in, in, in adding to it. But um, so the uh, Foundation for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act um, actually now mandates that federal departments have a chief data officer. <laughs> Uh, they are mandating, it mandates that we make data open by default unless we can provide a reason um, otherwise. Um, it uh, also asks federal departments to have evaluation plans um, and to, to map out how, that, how those evaluation plans would um, lead to policies that are evidence-based. And so it's really a, a transformative, uh, I think, piece of legislation if we Actually, and, and so I'll say this, I think any time something gets mandated uh, and, and, and there's a reporting function built out around it in the federal space, it's very easy for it to become a compliance activity. Uh, and so my hope is that where we really move towards is not just um, the letter of the law, but really the vision of the law, which is uh, ultimately how do you create a government <coughs> that is more data-driven and evidence-based in, in the way um, we form policies and how we think about resource allocation. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I do think that uh, the law sort of lays out that roadmap. HHS has, for the last two years, um, really been um, setting, I think, the foundation for, for doing this. So I think we might be a little bit ahead of the game uh, where we've uh, taken some time to understand the challenges um, when it comes to data sharing. Uh, and those are, you know, technical, yes, because um, we still put up PDFs on, on our websites and, and, and call it a day um, in many parts. Um, uh, you know, those are legal, so we have uh, statutory restrictions around how uh, data can be shared. Um, you know, we don't have workforce capacity to be able to actually meet the demands of, of, of what we're asking people to do. Um, uh, so, so those are some of the, some of the roadblocks. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the second part of your question. Uh, what are some of the outcomes, mental health, uh, yeah. pharmaceuticals, uh, that you're trying to drive towards, or you think you can drive yeah, towards? Yeah, so, so look, um, I, I think that we, um, given the enormous scale and scope of the department, are probably the stewards of the largest collection of healthcare information on the planet. Um, and, uh, you know, I think perhaps like one, to two percent of it gets used in any meaningful way by by folks who are entrepreneurs and researchers, uh, and the potential of connecting information. Let's say if you're looking at post-market surveillance data from FDA around the performance of a particular drug, or um, connecting that information um, to our our CMS information, which is um, the largest health insurer in the country. Um, can pinpoint emerging issues um, in a way that we just aren't able to right now. Uh, so, so I think the potential is enormous, um, and, and you may be aware of this, but I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, bring it up again, which is the opioid hackathon that the department hosted um, in 2017, where we made uh, 70 data sets um, uh, available for about 250 coders. Um, the reason I'm really proud of that is, is not just because we were addressing a specific concern, um, which is the opioid crisis uh, r right now in the country around treatment and prevention and understanding usage, but there were three winners that came out of that, uh, that event, and one of, those, um, one of those winners actually was mapping out where you can give back unused prescription pills 
um, because uh, um, those have been actually documented uh, to be used by um, you know, kids and households who then get addicted. Uh, and, and so returning those uh, and, and having a, a safe place to return those is a huge thing. That was developed during our event and then um, it was uh, actually taken up by Google and um, Google worked with CVS pharmacies and Walgreens and other pharmacies and collected even more data than what we had. So they took our data, state data, private data, and now, if you go on Google Maps, this was launched um, at scale uh, earlier this year, so about a year after our, our event. And you can go uh, now and search for take back locations across the country. Uh, so I think the power of data is enormous. <laughs> Clearly, we are not going to be within the federal departments, the ones who are coming up with all the innovations. Um, and and um, you know, 60% of the people who participated in our event actually identified themselves as coming from a non-healthcare background, which was phenomenal because you're getting, um, again, people, we provided the questions, right? We said, here are some of the things that we really need help with, and private sector come in and help us using our data. And so I think that's an example of a real public-private partnership in service of uh, one of the most pressing public health crises in this country. Uh, in a meaningful way and not just a one and done sort of an event. Well, thank you uh, for that uh, answer. Um, uh, Dan, uh, you were probably uh, one of the most instrumental uh, non-government actors in the Open Government Data Act uh, from analysis, from uh, providing thought leadership on the act. I was wondering if you could follow up to uh, Mo uh, Mona's uh, uh, description of what her agency is doing, what the future looks like, to talk about what you've seen since the act has been uh, adopted, and, and where do you see it heading um, here in the U.S. and even internationally from, from your perspective? Yeah, that was a great question. I mean, the, the good thing is the U.S. has had a strong open data culture in the federal government um, for some time, and so I think the act um, you know, kind of uh, boost what was already happening in a, in a very positive way and, and ensures that all government agencies are going to be moving in this direction. I think, you know, um, you know, codifying the need for a chief data officer at every agency is an important part of this because it's, it's saying to the agency, it's not just that you need someone who's going to be, you know, making the data open, but you need to be thinking about the entire data life cycle. And so you need to be thinking about the collection of it and um, how it's being used and you know, what kind of partnerships you have around the data. And that's the direction we want to move into this kind of more collaborative space. Um, as Mona said, it's not government that's going to be doing everything with the data. It's this kind of new way of thinking about government and its relationship with the public where um, it is collaborative um, and, and it's also more transparent and, and I think that leads to better outcomes. So the, uh, the bill passed in January. Um, at the same time, the administration was also working on the um, federal data strategy which um, since they had, a, 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 I think, a pretty good sense in the administration that this bill would likely pass, uh, the federal data strategy really orients a lot of these agencies around innovating with data as well. And so I think that you know, is also kind of moving government in this direction. Um, and then you know, the, the kind of maybe the third point I make here is that um, the Open Government Data Act applies to all, um, all federal data. Um, but there's also been um, some other uh, legislation that's focused on uh, spending data within government and, and making that open and standardized as well. And so a lot of government agencies have basically already gone through this exercise of how do we put data in machine-readable format, how do we make it available, how do we create it so it's more useful um, around their spending data. And now they're thinking about, okay, that spending data is a little bit easier because, you know, it's, it's all basically the same type of data. It's, you know, it's, it's amounts and, and where it goes. Now we can apply that same type of thinking, though, maybe more creatively as we have all these different types of data sets and we're thinking about how to use them. And so, you know, one example that I've seen that's come out, you know, kind of post-Open um, Government Data Act is with the Department of Education. And, you know, they made a commitment. Um, they have college scorecard, which you go and you see ratings about different universities and, and outcomes. Um, and they said they wanted to go further. They wanted to, you know, drill down and have more granular data. And so um, just recently, it was about two weeks ago, I think, they released um, a new, it was a beta data set. It included not only data at the university level, but also at the 
um, at the major level, so the different majors that people pursued at a lot of universities, and then what their, um, you know, what their student loans look like after a certain period of time, what the default rates look like, that kind of thing. And that's where I think we're moving into this area where, you know, you know they recognize, yeah, this data was useful, um, but you need to go further. If you want to empower people, if we, if we see how people are wanting to use this data, they want to use it to make a decision about what do I do at a university, okay, it's not just where do I go, but what do I do once I'm there? And so they're moving in that direction. I think that's what we want. And then the question is, how do you keep going further in this direction? Um, because the, the goal has to be to have this kind of feedback mechanism so the government's hearing what's working, what's not working, and you know, we keep moving to the space where it's, it's really about how you're empowering the, the user, whether it's business or consumers. Dan, if we may stay with you, um, you've done a lot of research on emerging technologies. Um, where do you see open data helping uh, things like AI, quantum, computing and some of the new the new tech uh, out there that we're, we're very excited about. Yeah, and that's, that's a good right point because um, part of, you know, we're doing a lot of research right now assessing where the U.S. stands in, in terms of artificial intelligence and how this will affect U.S. economic and national security. Um, and, you know, what we see is that, you know, the United States faces a significant challenge from um, from Europe in terms of the amount of research um, R&D that's going on in that space, as well as from China in terms of you know, the, the, the Chinese strategy in, in AI, um, as well as Canada, uh, who's doing a lot in this space as well. Um, and the question that we have is how do we remain competitive in this space? And when you look at machine learning and, and you know, how you know, basically uh, companies and firms are successful in this space, it's, it's through, of course, access to, to large amounts of structured and unstructured data. And a lot of this is coming from government. And so we did have an executive order from the president that highlighted the need to release uh, federal um, models and data that can contribute to machine learning. And I think that's a, a, a perfect um, you know, addition to what is trying to be achieved with the Open Government Data Act to say that government agencies, as they're evaluating their data sets and, and what to release publicly and how to prioritize it, that they need to be thinking about its implications on how this might be used around AI. And you know, particularly in, in, in healthcare and education, I think there's some really big opportunities. I mean, there was a, a great um, project that came out of Johns Hopkins that used HHS data that was around predicting, um, predicting diseases. So basically based on all the data that they were getting from HHS, um, you know, what likelihood, if you had certain symptoms, would you have certain diseases, just statistically? And, and that was you know, the type of innovations we want to see in this space. We want to see it around healthcare costs. Um, we want to see this around the opioid crisis. But the only way to get there is if government's making this data available, because oftentimes the private sector doesn't even have access to some of this information. It will never have access to it. And so government has to be a, a stakeholder in getting that out there. Can, can I add something really quickly to that, which is, you know, you connected the open data work to um, uh, AI. Um, and it's not something that people are doing sort of explicitly, but I think we need to make that case, and I'm certainly making that at HHS, which is that everyone wants to move to um, AI, right? Like, how do we become AI ready? Uh, and you can't have that unless you focus on uh, the non-glamorous part, which is really creating the foundation uh, that you need to be able to make data publicly available and in the right formats and at the right level. Um, and, and, and so I think um, actually building the, uh, building the case for that work has become easier um, because of the focus on AI as well. Um, but I think it is, it is essential to tie it in the minds of policymakers because it is not uh, explicitly tied. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tom, we heard uh, throughout today's discussion, you know, the role of the private sector, how, uh, you know, companies like Mapbox, you know, are driving, driving change. Uh, I'm curious if we could spend a little time from your perspective on the Open Government Data Act and some of the points that have been made by, by Mona and Dan. You know, how is it helping your business model? Are there, are there uh, opportunities, challenges you're facing? Uh, and particularly, you know, as you roll out, you know, new products and services for AI, uh, uh, you know, what are, uh, what are you facing? Uh, how can the government help? Uh, how can uh, 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 researchers and academics help uh, Mapbox be successful here? Sure. Um, well, so as, as Dan has mentioned, the Open Government Data Act really is a codification of existing policy. Um, I commend OMB Circular M1313 to everyone in the audience. It's a good read. Uh, and it's been around since 2013, issued by the Obama administration, and kept by this administration, which I think is a testament to what a good idea it is to have open by default machine-readable formats, to worry about privacy, to maintain enterprise and public inventories of data. 
Um, so this has been uh, the direction that agencies, as, as Mona indicated, have been uh, pushing toward for years now. Um, and actually, in the geospatial world, this has been sort of the baseline for even longer. I mentioned the census FTP server. That predates any government-wide uh, open data policy. Uh, it's because this data is so crucial for a variety of use cases that people found ways to open it up relatively early. Um, now, that's not to say that this law isn't important for us, though. It's another really crucial tool in the toolbox because open data is, frankly, continuously under assault. Some of the work that we did on the advocacy side in the last year is focused on programs like the National Agricultural Imagery Program and the current Landsat Fee Recovery Study. Um, NAEP is run by USDA, and it takes aerial imagery of the entire country uh, every couple of years. They are considering reducing the free, free, uh, collection frequency or putting it under a proprietary uh, license. Uh, and Landsat, this is actually, as some of the people investigating this work didn't realize, the third time they've tried to privatize this, uh, uh, it hasn't really worked very well in the past, and I, I don't think it's a great idea this time, but folks are understandably looking at this because these programs are expensive to run, and they want to try to recover whatever costs they can to make sure they can keep the lights on. Um, some of the proposals, frankly, are in direct tension with that aforementioned circular, and now they're in direct tension with the law of the U United States. Uh, as we make the case for why this data needs to remain open, those are really important things that we can bring to bear in our arguments. They are new planks for us to, to push on. Um, from my perspective, the remaining really difficult open questions in the open data universe for geospatial tend to involve bureaucracies that have, uh, you know, set ways of doing business where it's not going to be open to pry, it's not going to be easy to pry open these data sets because they are revenue streams that the Postal Service counts on, or they are data sets that the Supreme Court has said the census can't share, uh, or they are maintained by state and municipal authorities that DOT has limited levers to get them to, to uh, share or improve data quality on. So, um, yeah, I, I would say open data, the, the Open Data Act is absolutely important um, and uh, uh, essential for us to continue making the case and preserving the resources as, as they exist. Uh, I think that the, the future of advocacy on these questions, though, at least in the geospatial world, is going to be some of these really thorny interjurisdictional ones. Uh, Jamie, uh, I'd like you to close us out before we go to audience uh, questions with, uh, you know, you've been uh, a champion of open government uh, and uh, leading it across the, the national government of Canada. Um, what have you seen as lessons learned? Uh, you know, what, what lessons do, you know, has Canada learned from the U.S. efforts, the Open Government Data Act, uh, individual agencies like HHS, uh, what are your international colleagues saying is, you know, lessons learned, uh, what do we need to be doing in the future to enable this open open data future? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, I would put it in a few different buckets. Uh, the first one is really uh, an act is not enough. Um, the U.S. is far from the only country that has legislated this stuff. You, you have to do more than just legislate. Um, so culture, systems, that sort of thing. Uh, the value proposition is not systematically embraced, I think. And then there's a, a role for emerging tech, and I'll touch on each really briefly. So in terms of mainstreaming, um, we've had mandatory policy instruments in place for a number of years now. Um, many countries, I'm thinking Government of France, for example, with its law for a digital republic, a lot of countries have legislated this stuff. It's not enough to just slap a law on something and hope for the best, right? So you have to create systems and culture to enable real mainstreaming of this work. And I'll give you a couple of examples of ways that we've done that in Canada. One of the things that we required under our directive on open government was the creation of data inventories. Um, and it was really, really positive. We did it because we wanted to say, okay, what's the universe of Government of Canada data holdings? And on the basis of that, prioritize the, the release of high quality content, clean it up, get it out, sort of thing. What we found was that there was actually very poor information management to start with. So open data, um, sort of the excuse of open data, obliged us to get ourselves organized in terms of our data assets. And then once we had created those inventories, we were able to then work with the departments and agencies in the federal family to push this agenda forward. It was also really interesting, though, um, a very large department, about 20,000 employees, um, the first time that they did this data inventory exercise, um, we said, well, we, we don't actually need to see the data. We just need to see what the data holding is. So give us the metadata and we'll follow up later for the actual data. Um, and the first time around, they told us that I think it was something like 55% of their data was too sensitive to even name. 
I was like, do you even name? Are you kidding me? Like, I know that governments have no fly lists. Like, the, the fact that you have a no fly list is not, that maybe the content of it is sensitive, but the fact that, like, 55%, you're dreaming in technicolors, right? And so then we go and we do our capacity building, and we talk about the value of open data, and we went around a year later and we did the same exercise again. And we, we said, okay, you, you do your, your inventory, your list of data sets, um, and if it's too sensitive, whatever, just call it X. Second time around, any ideas what that percentage was that was too sensitive be, to be named? It was 8%, okay? So nothing had changed. The data was not less sensitive. We just had a better understanding and the culture had started to shift. So the department was saying, ah, okay, so maybe, there, maybe there's privacy risks associated with the content of that data set, but I have tools and understanding on how to anonymize or how to you know, get that data to a, to a format that would be appropriate for public consumption. Right? So that culture building is, is really, really important and absolutely painstaking. So that's a, that's a big piece of it. Uh, second sort of lessons, set of lessons learned is around the value proposition. There is, there is still a lot of work to be done. You know, um, I go out and talk to, to government en entities all the time and I say, well, you know, the, the fact that trucks are getting between, uh, over the border efficiently between Canada and the US, that's open data. The fact that, so I'm from Western Canada, just north of Washington State, the fact that we know how to fight fires efficiently um, in the summertime when our entire province is on fire, that's federal geospatial data mashed up with provincial historical data on the prevalence of forest fires with predictive modeling around the spread of forest fires. And then there's actually a company you can slap on the, the little VR goggles and you can simulate being a forest fighter in a helicopter fighting these fires, right? And so. It's kind of cool for us to be able to go out and say, open data literally saves lives. And you get these people who are kind of staring at me the way you're staring at me right now, like, really? This lady is nuts. But no, seriously, the, the, the value proposition of open data is very significant. And in the digital world, it's only becoming more and more significant. And that's the third sort of bucket of lessons learned that I, that I would focus on. And that's that emerging tech needs open data, right? You look at, like everybody's talking about AI, great, fantastic. How are you gonna train your AI, right? You need excellent training data, and some of the best data for training a lot of the machine learning algorithms right now, at least in Canada, is Government of Canada Open Data, right? So I talked to you, I just mentioned earlier that we engaged about 10,000 Canadians around the development of our fourth national action plan on open government. Well, I took all that content and I released the, the raw, unstructured content in a very, very loosely structured data set as open data. And I know it sounds weird, right, uh, to say you took unstructured qualitative data and released it as open data. Yes, we did that. And now we're training AIs on the basis of that, right? And so now you've got Canadian startups that have fantastic training data and are able to compete on the world stage because they were able to train their algorithms with better content than many other countries have, right? So we need to think through what emerging <laughs> tech is going to do for our ecosystem, how can it help us push this agenda forward, and how can we have this, this sort of cross-sector collaboration to build out, um, ultimately, better services for our citizens. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thank you uh, for that uh, look towards the future and you know, sharing the efforts of the Canadian government. We have a couple of minutes for some questions for the audience of our distinguished panel. Uh, I do want to make sure we get you out on time for the big keynote this morning. Um, we do have a microphone that we can pass around, or one on staff, uh, Jarrett has it. would ask that you please state your name, uh, where you're from, and also uh, please ask a question. So just by hands, <laughs> uh, for the benefit of our panelists. Think of Jeopardy, you'll be fine. Hi, I'm Kevin Tsao from Capital One. And I have a question for, for Jimmy. Uh, besides open data, do you have uh, any other policies to encourage private sector to use those data? Uh, second question is, is there any effective ways for the for private sector to communicate with government um, if they find some valuable by using your data? Oh, this feels like a planted question. That was so good. <laughs> so the first thing that I would encourage you to do is Google Open Canada Suggested Data Set. We have a suggested data set function precisely for that reason. Um, again, we, we have embraced open by default. I wish we were open by default. 
even more so, but we do have privacy and security considerations. So uh, we did experiment with being truly open by default, taking our internal document repository system and connecting it to our, our user-facing interface, um, which was a little bit nutty and, you know, you find all my typos and the speeches are right for my minister and all that. Um, but yeah, we can be open by default, but to a large extent, a lot of the really valuable data often does have privacy considerations. So we can't just say, oh, it's open, and if you find some private information, oops, right? So we do have to take risk-based approaches, which is why we've, we've really drawn on this suggested data set uh, function. So people go on there and they say, hey, I wish I could have some data on whatever, and then my team will go out and work with the departments and agencies to see if we can, if we can find that. And you find really interesting uh, cases of service providers and things that I, I would never think to prioritize. Um, you know, there was a company not that long ago that desperately wanted um, fish concentration data. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, we'll, like, we'll see what we can do, right? And the service that they're providing, um, the company's called Fish Boy. It's, um, you, you can go and you can say, hey, I want to go fishing, and it'll say, oh, you want to find pickerel? All right, go to this lake here. And, you know, it's, it's this fun little tool for, you know, I guess optimizing the fishing experience. You know, not my personal priority, but there's some person who's created a, a number of jobs. Uh, same kind of deal, um, there was a, a request to access uh, a 3D scan of our fighter jets um, from a federal museum. And again, it's like, sure, you want a 3D, go nuts, right? What they ended up doing was creating uh, historically realistic video games, um, and they ended up generating a company that now has 35 jobs in Toronto on the basis of open data around fighter jets. Like, I, I would have never dreamed up that use case, but if you take a demand-driven approach and you publish with a purpose, I think we can have really positive impact. We have tried to work a little bit with, um, with incubators and accelerators. So one of Canada's biggest incubators is Communitech based out of Waterloo, Ontario. Um, that's been pretty helpful. I think the other really big tool for advancing open data sort of on a, on a collaborative basis is federal procurement. Um, you know, we, we do do a lot of work, like when we're generating data, uh, on a cross-sector basis, we'll encourage folks to, to release the data. Sometimes we require it. All the contracts that come out of my team, they're required to, any IP that's generated is required to be released under our federal open government license. So I think that there are tools that we can put in place to make this more systematic. We have time for one more question. Who's it gonna be? Chair. Hey guys, uh, Sean Lewis. I work for a consulting firm that consults for the government. Uh, a lot of the problems that we run into when it comes to working with data, especially interagency data and cross-agency data, is standardization. So location data, um, names for things, kind of the whole governance. How do you guys suggest getting Department of Defense and Department of Justice and all these different agencies speaking the same language when it comes to using the same type of data? So so, no, no, please, go ahead. <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. It's a, it's a huge problem right now, and I think um, doing open data in the first place helps get agencies to start talking to each other. Um, I mean, we've seen this in, in a lot of our work. Um, you know, we focus on a number of different issues where, um, for example, we were looking at uh, data around sexual assault. Um, you, the, one of the reasons you can't get a good number for this is because every agency reports and defines it differently. Um, and there were, I think, 19 different definitions there. Um, so the data was just completely uh, incompatible, right? Even at the point of collection, not even at the point of release. And so I, I think the way you solve these issues is you have to have communities of practice around different types of problems. I think we're starting to see that where, you know, government agencies are trying to um, orient themselves around particular problem areas, um, and then they, they come together and they say, well, here's our joint assets, and then how do we make these assets work together? So you're seeing that with the opioid crisis, for example, with states and, you know, they have these, um, you know, the prescription data monitoring programs and, and they're starting to say, okay, if we're collecting this data, can we collect it in similar ways? And is this interoperable with the other types of data? And, you know, then we have the prescriber data that's coming out of, you know, these, um, you know, these prescriber systems. Are we getting that and can we pull it out? Um, and I think that's, you know, the only way to attack these is, is by having these, you know, focused areas um, of, of problem solving. I think that's where government can do more leadership as well um, because there's, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to, to really define particular problems. And we've seen this at the local level happen, play out a little bit more. So for example, in San Francisco, um, you know, they define very specific problems they were trying to tackle with their open data. So for example, homelessness. And they developed whole you know, systems around, uh, here's the data we have and here's where we're pulling it. And I, I think that's the only way you move the conversation. 
there are a few areas where I think there's government reorganization that can help. So for example, around economic statistical data, you know, we have all these different agencies that aren't always, you know, you have Department of Labor, you have Department of Commerce, they have their own statistical agencies and, and feeding that together is really hard. And I think some of that needs, you know, bureaucratic reorganization. But a lot of this is really around just getting people focused on the same problem. And with that, please join me in thanking our panel with a round of applause. And please join uh, the rest of us, uh, convention attendees, uh, for the keynote in Halls D&E. Thank you very much.